Partnered by Times Influence. Institute for Competitiveness partnered with Times Network to present Michael Porter 2017, an initiative organized to foster competitiveness in India. The event was attended by business leaders, management gurus, government stakeholders and aspiring entrepreneurs to understand the landscape of competitiveness in India. ET Now's Chief Editor News, Supriya Srinath, gave a powerful keynote address. Thank you very much uh, for being an audience right here and for participating in this event. Uh, it really is a one of a kind. I've been meaning to hear Professor Porter for a while. And uh, I know you've been hearing a lot of speakers here, uh, people from government and a whole host of speakers lined up through the day as well. I just thought we should speak about competitiveness at large and competitiveness not just for my channel or for the network but even uh, from a country's point of view India at large and how competitive we are and you know being a business journalist you have access to reports that come in from brokerages all across the world uh, from institutions like the IMF or the World Bank and you keep hearing that India is this shining spot India is the sweet spot India is perhaps the only hope in an otherwise gloomy world it's very good to hear that but then you sometimes step back and say is this relative to the rest of the world? Is this relative uh, to what the entire world is seeing? And sometimes the answer to that question is yes. I mean, we shining relative to the rest of the world, which isn't, which is rather dark. And so you, then you turn back and say, what are we doing to increase competitiveness? And then, you know, without uh, seeing appearance of this government, I think a lot is being done. Many steps being taken uh, at, at the last mile level, at the, at the grassroots level. And, uh, you know, uh, with things at large. One of the changes that I think uh, increasing competitiveness, the context is that there is a lot of political capital and political will to bring about reforms, to increase competitiveness, to do things that will increase competitiveness, which will perhaps not always be easy to do and will not always be palatable uh, politically to do. And which is why I keep going back to saying the political capital is very important and the government does have it. We take great uh, pride in partnering with the Institute for Competitiveness uh, for this event because I think to hear people in a freewheeling chat uh, talk about competitive edge, to talk about competitive advantage that India can leverage is indeed a pleasure. And I'm sure all of us will go back a little wiser today. Thank you very much. Important stakeholders of the industry got together to discuss the next drivers for job creation, enhanced productivity, business environment at the state level and the role of firms in enhancing the state competitiveness. So I, I just think, you know, when we talk about India's competitive edge and how can India enhance its uh, competitiveness, even though I just spoke about tomorrow and how the world will be very different, we just have to keep talking about that one thing, which is infrastructure. And let's just for the uh, ease of doing this, let's begin with Mr. Uh, Suraj there. And so what can India do at the level of states to ensure that adequate flow of knowledge capital happens? I mean, we just can't be talking in isolation about physical infrastructure without talking about knowledge capital, without talking about all of this, when we talk about harnessing a competitive advantage. So coming straight to the states, uh, one of the things that in my interaction with the states uh, I've been talking about to them is that uh, different states, I mean, we are in an environment where states are competing for investment and they are obviously uh, in the last few years you would have seen a number of uh, state road shows uh, where they're all sort of seeking investment. I think two things stand out. One is that uh, there is a great deal that states can learn from each other. There are, st uh, I, and I had to actually go to some of these governments and say that look at the policy in that state and, and there is still a lot of disconnect uh, where people are still trying to you know, find their own uh, things rather than looking at what's been working. But more importantly, uh, one thing uh, you know, which I have objected to at times, you know, the, the big announcements of the thousands of crores that are promised for in investments in different states, I think where people miss the point is that uh, the biggest attractor for investment is the success of existing businesses. Uh, a state which can showcase its existing businesses doing well, investors who have come in and done well, are probably, uh, they are the best advertisers for those states. That's a fair point indeed. You want to add to that, that I think at, at one level states or, or policy makers at large are very obsessed with attracting the top dollar, which is new. I, I just think in the bargain somewhere we miss the guys who've been on the ground, who've sunk in their money, 
who are working there, uh, do they kind of get ignored in this entire bargain? I, I don't think so. I think the most important thing government can do for them is to stay out of their way where they need to stay out. And I think they do do it. Some states do it better than others. Some others don't. But having said that, there is an acute paucity of both domestic and large pools of foreign capital coming into India today. If you look at most of the large pools of foreign capital, they're still not there because the, if you look at the private equity funds, or if you look at the VC funds, the amount of money which has come in over the last 15 years and the amount of money which has gone back, even returning back capital, just the capital which has been borrowed, not the return on it, is a tiny fraction. Therefore, I think the attractiveness of the top dollar is, is very, very important. You know, you say paucity of, of, of funds, and I'm going to just take a quick question before I move on. What about these astronomical FDI numbers and the uh, very robust growth that is being reported then? I mean, isn't that money that's coming to India? I think there is some, some kind of capital is coming in. There is FDI coming in in some of the large projects. I was specifically talking, specifically talking about private equity and venture capital funds, where last year was a very high year, but this year hasn't been so high. Some, of, some people attribute it to demonetization. I'm not sure that's the right answer. I think exits last year were very, very high. And the exits this year hasn't been so high. And it's, it's beginning to show an increasing trend. I think having said that, there is in general, if you look at the large global pools of capital, are they coming into India despite the 7% rate of growth, 7.5% rate of growth, which is the highest anywhere in the world? The answer is a no. You agree? I mean, I think that's a, that's a leg of discussion that we need to have before we just go into competitiveness. You agree with this, that the large fund is not coming despite us being a quote-unquote sweet spot in the world? See, I think you have to start somewhere. I agree with Srivatsa, by the way, that you know, the, the mood of private equity and venture capital has come down a little. And that is also because I think there was a little bit of overhype on startup India. And a lot of the initial funded startups in the e-commerce space, I mean, obviously, most of them were doomed to failure because there is only so much you can do in e-commerce when the premise seems to be to take money from investors and give it to consumers. So that was never going to be sustainable. But I think what is now beginning to happen is a much more thoughtful B2B uh, environment. And my belief is that if you look at what private equity is funding today, they're funding real businesses. They're funding businesses which are in manufacturing, even in agriculture, which have a huge global salience. And I think that will happen primarily if you focus on competitiveness. And my belief is India will be competitive if it focuses on digital, because that's the way to reach out to large numbers of customers. And definitely, as Mike was saying, you focus on skills. Unless you have adequately skilled people and they are, there's adequate workforce participation, as he said, you can't succeed. So I think it's beginning to happen. And I agree with Srivatsa that this government has done a lot. And now we will see the real fruits of those early endeavors. The other part of this entire discussion and debate is have we focused too much on the macros to increase competitiveness? You spoke about private and public sector. We are trying to bring in the private sector into areas where government has not been doing a good role. Institute for Competitiveness partnered with Times Network to present Michael Porter 2017. The eminent panelists deliberated on policy imperatives to enhance competitiveness at both the state and the union level. I'm going to ask this question to Krish. And Krish, I know this is not perhaps directly related to where you come from, but the whole Indian startup space was supposed to be created in India and, you know, uh, festered here and then it would have taken off. But the startup space is actually, you know, being called shots by an Amazon, an Alibaba, or a Master Yoshi Zone is actually calling the shots here. So where is the Indian startup space? I mean, where is the competitive uh, competitiveness that we can leverage there? Because look at the guys who are calling the shots. The entire focus in case of startups has been in technology. And there are still a lot of startups which are there in the bricks and mortar space not, I'm not talking about retail. I'm talking about startups which are doing work in, uh, uh, on the agricultural side, on the food processing side. We deal with startups in terms of buying goods from them and developing them. But they don't get the limelight because uh, their funding is not talked about, their valuations are not talked about. 
they are not working for valuations, they are working for profits. And they're doing some serious business. And it's a slow process. So the startups that gain the limelight are really running after valuations and therefore doing all the wrong things in terms of not uh, creating profitable businesses, but just working for valuations. And that's where I think, uh, so if we really start looking at startups, real startups, uh, which are doing a lot of work in tier two, tier three towns, and developing good businesses, uh, I think there is a success story which is emerging there, and it's a slow burn, it's a, it's a slow, process, slow process. Fair point indeed. We're just gonna take a break from startups because I'm sure when I come to questions, there'll be many more on startups, and that's uh, such a buzzing topic. But uh, let me ask you, you know, we keep talking about this technological diffusion that needs to happen between public and private for us to be more competitive. Uh, you know, that the kind of technology that private can boost off, uh, public still finds for. I'm just saying, how can the technological diffusion perhaps be made more conducive? Because that is very, very critical to being competitive. I think the public sector, the private sector is a little more absorbing the technological advancement that is taking place. And one thing that the government originally missed out, I think after the two uh, five-year plans, uh, what Nehru had done was education came in. And later on, I think government pulled back money spending on education. And then the private sector came in with all these uh, business opportunities and educating people. And I think that is where the technology is getting absorbed. And uh, if you go by what Ganesh is doing and the companies he's headed in the past, those are all in the private sector that did. And I don't think the public sector, who were then in the IT business or even the telecom sector, they haven't done very well. So it goes back to the private people of putting money and showing entrepreneurship. Okay, and that, and that kind of capital needs to be respected. But Srivats, let me just come to you. Uh, the other part of this entire discussion and debate is, have we focused too much on the macros to increase competitiveness? Instead of really looking at individual states, individual verticals, individual sectors to increase that competitiveness. Are we making this debate very macro for years now? So let me give you the example of what I do today. I'm the CEO of India's Coffee Board and I took over this job a month ago. And we are trying to bring together the public and the private sector at the micro level. For instance, we have about, we are the fourth or fifth largest producer of coffee in the world. And we produce, we have 3.3 lakh small farmers producing coffee. And we have sort of remained stagnant at a level of production for the last four or five years. We see a couple of years where we have a hike in production, but otherwise it's sort of a secular stagnation. What are we trying to do? You spoke about private and public sector. We are trying to bring in the private sector into areas where government has not been doing a good role. For example, we are bringing in uh, companies in the startup space to work with coffee planters in the area of uh, estimation of coffee, in the area of pest management, extension services for farmers. And we are working, we're just beginning work with some uh, very interesting startups at the NASCOM Startup Warehouse in Karnataka to do this. So at we have a macro level policy which is already in place to improve coffee production. And we are also looking at bringing in private sector into areas which they have not come before. The second thing, think about it. When you all think of tea, you all think of Darjeeling tea or Assam tea. When you think of coffee, there is no branded coffee in India. You think of cappuccino or you think of Starbucks. So one of the things government is hoping to change is to brand Indian coffee. Why can't we have Araku coffee? Why can't we have Kur coffee, Chikmaglur coffee, and brand it and sell it in high street in different parts of the world. That's another initiative we are taking. And lastly, we are trying to uh, tie up the large retailers and you know, rebrand India Coffee House, which is a well-known brand owned by the government, with the small growers. The idea is when we, at the farm gate, the price of coffee varies between 170 to 240 rupees per kilo. Whereas by the time it reaches a CCD or a Starbucks, it's 2x or 3x of the number. How can, how can we connect the small grower with the high street retailers and get the small growers better pricing for their coffee? All this we are trying to do in partnership with the private sector. Okay, Siraj, I'm going to ask you a question that that industry usually grapples with. Uh, how crucial is interest rate or, or labor cost in terms of, you know, harnessing or leveraging competitiveness. We've seen examples of countries like Sweden and Germany that have done very well uh, despite high wages as well as labor shortages. Our, I mean, I'll continue from where uh, Srivats is saying. I mean, talking about uh, plantations, I mean, 
today you have a situation in the tea industry where tea prices are you know, determined by market forces, but the wages keep going up, and which is essentially making the whole area uncompetitive or unprofitable. And, and, and that's uh, one challenge that we have, that while the labor costs are going up, uh, we are not getting that price for a lot of our commodities, actually. And, and then you get to a situation where, uh, you know, you, and what Mr. P or Dr. P uh, Porter talked about, that, uh, you know, while you have one of the reasons or one of the mechanism being deployed by a lot of organizations today uh, to grow profitability is to shed labor or shed employees. And, and that is a conflict from what he was saying, that uh, you can't have overall wellness uh, with companies doing well and, uh, you know, the employees and therefore the society not doing so well. Uh, and we see that a lot in the agri space uh, where the cost of producing is going up while the returns to the farmer are not uh, going up concurrently or uh, commensurately. I'm sorry, that's all the time that I have. Thank you very much for being a lovely audience. And uh, the Thank deliberations you. on the panel do take us to India and can it enhance its competitive advantage? Of course, the answer to that is yes, but it has to be a concerted effort, both from the government, the industry, and of course, the last mile, which is always the states. Thank you very much. Thanks each one of you. Next up was Wilfried Olber, managing partner of Roland Berger, who presented his research highlighting Indian lessons on competitiveness. I'll start out by looking at where we are and then talk about a framework that we use to look at companies and also uh, governments in terms of understanding uh, competitiveness. So what are some of the challenges that we have? One challenge is there's really no India and that is something if you go back to Europe or you go to the US, you talk to companies, it's something that you have to explain to many of them. We are de facto the European Union of Asia, probably even much more complex, whether it's on a GDP per capita basis where we have a large spread, whether it's on social progress indicators. If we're looking at the same GDP per capita, states have done very, very differently in terms of their social progress. We do have uh, an advantage, and that's a demographic dividend. Inequality is an issue. I don't think I have to talk about uh, it in detail. Uh, it is an issue that's been talked about a lot in the West, but we have it here firsthand. Uh, if we look at quality of life, again, dramatic improvements over the last 25 years. There's no doubt about it. Education was talked about earlier. Yes, we are doing well on primary education. Secondary is an issue, tertiary is an issue, and also outcomes, even in primary education, are a challenge. It is about making sure that the country as such comes together and everybody does their part in terms of uh, cleaning up the environment. Institute for Competitiveness partnered with Times Network to present Michael Porter 2017. We bring you the last part of Wilfried Olber's research on Indian lessons on competitiveness. Uh, now if we look at what this means, uh, or how we can understand it, basically if we think about VUCA environments, whether it's for companies or for governments, we believe that there are six levers that we can use to really drive change and improve the situation. One is operational excellence. Innovation, I think the government has done a really remarkable job. We have UPIs, we have the Aadhaar card, we have penetration of bank accounts. Choices in trade-off are basically, in our thinking, uh, relate to what are our main priorities. We have created over the last few years a very stable macroeconomic environment. And we're now shifting focus more and more on job creation. And job creation, again, does not mean necessarily only IT. IT is great. Canadians uh, are good uh, representatives of, representative of the industry. But real jobs can be created in construction. The last budget has recognized this. Alignment. It is about making sure that the country as such comes together 
and everybody does their part in terms of uh, cleaning up the environment. Leadership and courage to create competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis other players. And last but not least, agility and serendipity. Agility in government is a little bit more challenging. Your responsibility is much higher. If you're running a company, it's nice, it's an important job, but overall your impact is somewhat limited as compared to government. So to summarize, the world is getting increasingly complex. It's always been complex in India. Companies, governments need to continue to excel along these six levers to drive uh, progress and performance in, uh, uh, in their respective areas of responsibility, but it's not rocket science. It's not something that you can't do. It requires consistent execution, and in the case of politics, it also requires cooperation across the aisle. With that, thank you very much. Later in the event, Santosh Babu of OD Alternatives shared his views on competitiveness in India. I'm actually in a field called organization development and culture change, so I thought it would be interesting to look at from our perspective. I would never say that we are an expert in the area of competitiveness. So I was, I'm trying to give a perspective around, if you really look at what are the three divides that we face in the world, and how our actions could be then based on that. So if you want to really bucket it, we can clearly see these three divides, which are part of the world that you are in. There is an ecological divide, there is a social divide, and there is a spiritual divide. I'll just take a minute to explain. Growth always necessarily doesn't mean happiness, contentment, or fulfillment. So, uh, so one is clearly we see the development happening and more and more we see this ecological divide happening. And at the same time, there is also the social divide, social divide in terms of culture, in terms of the wealth. As a joke, I always say that eradicating poverty is a multi-billion dollar business. So one of those things you need to stop because poverty eradication is a big, billion, big, big business and it's been going on. And the divide is uh, anyway happening. There is a social divide that happens. And there is a spiritual divide. What I mean by spiritual divide is that more and more human beings are not able to be in touch with themselves. There is a divide between who I am, the divide between my being and my doing. I feel it's not about going out and figuring out something. All that human beings need to do is to go in and figure out our own innate true nature, our innate true ability to connect with another human being, our innate ability to care for the planet, our innate ability to connect and make a difference. That's where I'll stop. How do you do away with a vast number of rules, regulation, procedure, laws and acts that have been built up over the years. So one of the things that have been done in this country is that we've scrapped 1175 laws in the last two and a half years. Partnered by Times Influence.